Hello, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's Beyond the Screen, presented by the Virginia Film Festival, a virtual conversation series. My name is Jody Kilbasa. I'm the director of the Virginia Film Festival and vice provost for the arts at the University of Virginia. And I'd like to welcome our very special guests this afternoon. We have with us D.W. Young, the director of the Booksellers. D.W. Young's films have screened at festivals around the world, including South by Southwest, Vancouver International Film Festival, the Maryland Film Festival, the Provincetown Film Festival, the Sarasota Film Festival, and many more. His features, A Hole in a Fence, and The Happy House were released by First Run Features. Most recently, his short, A Favor for Jerry, filmed on election night 2016, premiered at IFF Boston. Julia Krotovitz is the owner and general manager of the New Dominion Bookshop on the historic downtown mall in Charlottesville, Virginia. Founded in 1924, the New Dominion Bookshop is Charlottesville's only all new independent bookstore. Molly Schwartzberg, curator of the Albert and Shirley Small Special Collections Library, joins us as well. Molly builds collections, curates exhibitions, works with researchers and teaches classes at the UVA Albert and Shirley Small's Special Collections Library. Her largest collecting area is books and manuscripts of the 20th and 21st centuries, though she acquires materials of all kinds across all periods. She re received her AB in English Literature from Harvard and her PhD in English and American Literature from Stanford. Molly's most recent publication is an article, Frank Shea's Greenwich Village, Reconstructing the Bookshop at 4 Christopher Street. Today's moderator, Sarah Lawson, is the assistant director of the Virginia Center for the Book. A longtime resident of Charlottesville and attendee of the Virginia Festival of the Book, Sarah is also a freelance designer and writer with a focus on regional arts and culture. A little bit about today's film, The Booksellers, D.W. Young's elegant and absorbing documentary is a lively tour of New York's book world, populated by an assortment of obsessives, intellects, eccentrics, and dreamers. From the Park Avenue Armory's annual antiquarian book fair to the Strand and Argosy bookstores to the beautifully crammed apartments of collectors and buyers, the film celebrates a community of dedicated book dealers and collectors who strongly believe in the wonder of the object and what it holds from within. The film is available to rent from Violet Crown Virtual. Sarah, if you could take it away. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you so much, Jody, and thank you to DW, Molly, and Julia for joining us today. Uh, thank you all for attending as well, uh, and hope that you will go ahead and post any questions that you have during our conversation in the Q&A area at the bottom of your Zoom window. Uh, we will be taking questions throughout and then also at the end, so as things come to mind, feel free to type them in and we will try to get to all of them. Um, so to start things out, uh, I thought we would start at a similar place as where the film starts actually with uh, the Susan Sontag quote that is uh, read at the beginning. Uh, she talks about books as many, many things, uh, but you know, ultimately lands on the idea that books are a way of being fully human. Uh, and I feel like that's very similar for how we engage with films, uh, especially documentaries. Uh, when we watch movies together, there's something that really kind of builds a sense of humanity in each of us. Uh, even if we're watching that movie at home on a laptop rented from Violet Crown as a you know, virtual program. Uh, so I hope that if you haven't seen the video or the film that you will watch it soon. Um, hopefully today's conversation will give you a little bit of an idea of what it's about though. And if you have seen it, hopefully this will be a deeper dive that will um, bring you even more joy. So DW, I thought we could start with you. Um, if you could talk a little bit about what prompted you to make the film in the first place, and ultimately what you hoped people would get out of it. Uh, and you need to unmute, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. I thought they had muted me. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, you know, the films, the, the very origin of the film actually lies with one of our producers, Dan Wexler who um, in, above being and beyond being involved in some film work is a well-known rare book dealer here in New York with Sanctuary Books. And he and Judith Mizraki, our other producer and I, Judith and I are married and we've worked together many times over the years, um, had become friends. We, she had worked on a project of his. We 
And so we'd become friends and he was talking to us over lunch about seven years ago about how he'd always thought a book about, uh, rather a documentary about the rare book world would be a great idea, it had never been done. Um, and it, he felt, you know, there's a lot of potential there. And he of course was intimately acquainted with many people and sort of aspects of the book world. So he was very informed in that regard. Uh, Judith and I had also been to the Ennecran Book Fair at the Armory the year before. So we'd had a really full on experience with kind of the visual potential that maybe wasn't always appreciated by other people. Um, when you just mentioned the rare book world, people maybe think, you know, brown leather spines or something. Um, so we were very enthusiastic and, you know, as readers and book lovers and people who spend a lot of time in bookstores in our lives, I think we, you know, also just felt, and English majors felt very, you know, strongly about the material. Um, my aunt and uncle had been rare news book dealers for many years in Philadelphia. Um, and as a kid, I very occasionally got to go to their bookstore. And that was always a big deal for me. I got to, you know, I could go in the back, I could man the bargain cart once in a while. And they were very full on eccentric book people. So um, I had a little bit of a personal fondness to, you know, to tap into, but we really went from there and um, we didn't, you know, we had other projects going on. So it took a few years before we fully engaged this one, but about three years ago was when we started on it. Um, and the second part of your question, I think was, what did I hope to achieve from it? Yeah, what did you hope that people would really take away from it? Well, you know, that, that, that evolved a little over the course of it. I think, you know, the first thing we were thinking of was just that rare book dealers deserve to be recognized more and that it was a wonderful group of people and um, that a lot of the sort of, the beauty of what they did had never been sort of presented on film. And so that I think was a, and that we felt like it was a world you could kind of go into and enter into and that we could hopefully capture that. I think as we went, and I think we had, I, we all had a desire to convey also some of the seriousness of the work that they did, um, that they do rather, and collectors as well. But I think as we, as we sort of moved through, and Dan of course, I think was more immediately attuned to that as a dealer. But as we, as I certainly moved deeper into it and researched and talked to more people and became more informed, I think that solidified as a stronger component of the film, that there'd be an argument about sort of the value beyond sort of the mercantile of what everyone in this world does. Yeah, and so Molly, to, to turn to you, you actually know a lot of the people and work with a lot of, pe of the people who are featured in the film, right? As in your curatorial role. Um, and you actually, everyone can just go ahead and unmute maybe. Um, <laughs> but could you talk a little bit about what your interactions are like as a curator who is actually collecting and working with those book dealers and other collectors uh, in that world? Sure, yeah. So I go to the New York uh, Antiquarian Book Fair almost every year. Um, and so the aisles that everybody's walking, all the booths, all the dealers, they all either look familiar to me or they're people who I, I get my program and I mark off who I'm going to go see first to make sure I get in before anyone else to see what I know are going to be the treasures I'm looking for. Um, and yeah, so to me, this, this is my world. It was um, sort of surreal to see this side of what I do represented on film. And um, so for me, it's going to those book fairs. It's also um, getting catalogs from dealers um, in the mail. Um, less of that today than getting emailed catalogs. And actually Tuesday is the big day. It's the day that the dealers are allowed to post on this listserv that's used by a lot of librarians. It's the one day that they can post things for sale. And so on Tuesdays, you have to be ready to open up catalogs because sometimes um, things sell within five minutes or even three minutes of a catalog um, arriving um, in your email inbox. Um, I also interact with dealers um, when they come to appraise collections um, that someone is donating to us. Um, and they sometimes help with big projects, um, either appraising collections or serving as the sort of interim person between the seller and us, between the owner and us, often with archives. Um, and so it's a really rich world. Um, and so these dealers are really a big part of my professional community. That's amazing, yeah. And I, I feel like both in terms of the personalities that are presented in the film and the people that you also work with then, Molly, um, you get a real sense for the, the uh, let's say, uniqueness of each individual person. Um, I think that there is a lot of attention that you gave in how you portrayed people at DW that, you know, went 
above and beyond in a, in a lot of ways to really show people as fully fleshed out humans who play on a baseball team or seven, uh, you know, and have really, you know, personalities outside of just book world. Uh, and I think that that is something that really makes the documentary unique. It is not just people who are like in their uh, dark, dank uh, book rooms, but they, they really are people. And I, I think that part of that, uh, shows in the very, very last scene of the film where Fran Leibowitz tells the David Bowie story. And I won't give any spoilers, but you know, everyone should sit through the credits and make it to the very end. Uh, and I think you must have just heard so many incredible stories while you interviewed people. And uh, just, I would love to hear more about how you sifted through those and what got left on the cutting floor, cutting room floor that you wished you could have included. Yeah, well, a lot got left on the cutting floor, of course, unfortunately. And I think pretty much with everyone we spoke to, we would like would have loved to have included five more minutes easily um, of great material. But, you know, at some point you have to just make those choices. You know, it's funny. It's, I, I love the idea that everyone is much more than the sort of the conventional notion of a rare book dealer. And, of course, that was great to pursue that further. Um, you know, like you talk about Dave playing softball, you know, I didn't make the film, but Jim Cummins was playing ice hockey until he was 60, I think. And he had, we were at his warehouse and there's a, there was a picture of him with a hockey team playing in Mongolia. And he was like 58 years old. And I was just totally taken aback because I was in the middle of someone with 300,000 books who's also played ice hockey in Mongolia. And it just seems so crazy. Um, but, you know, I think, um, I think part of it was just the desire to celebrate, you know, the way that everyone in the book world is unique and that there's no strict path to becoming a rare book dealer, nor is there to becoming a, a bookseller in general, I think. And um, there's no academic degree you can get. And uh, the fact that everyone sort of, it's sort of like a calling almost, I think. And that's how a lot of people feel about it. And so I, I love the, how everyone has their kind of coming to the trade story to tell. And sometimes, you know, there are, there are similarities. Also, sometimes many people do come from, some degree of maybe academia where they started in academia and then they changed their minds or they even may have gone further but then took a fork in the road. Yeah and and Julia that actually is a great connecting point with New Dominion Bookshop. Um, as a new um, bookseller you are not part of the antiquarian book trade uh, as a lot of people in the film are talking about it but you are one of the community bookshops that really is kind of experiencing a revival these days. So maybe you could talk a little bit about what your experience is uh, in that community of fellow bookshops and kind of how you have found your calling in that in that same way. Well, thanks. Um, as DW says, I think many people don't start off to become booksellers, but um, it's something either you're not suited for anything else. So you come from academia, you love books, um, you have a little bit of a sense of hustle. Um, you're really good at dealing with people. Um, that's really where, where, where it comes from. Um, unlike Molly, I don't think I knew anyone in the film. <laughs> um, I had um, read their books, um, but it was really wonderful to see this other side of, um, of the book world and, and how it's some similarities and some differences. Like as Molly said, Tuesday is the big day for us. Tuesday is the day usually that our big releases come out. So We'll, they'll get shipped to us. We'll get them on Thursday or Friday. We'll catalog them. We'll have them out and ready to sell on Tuesday. So that's interesting. That's the same across the industry. In other ways, it's very, very different. Um, you know, a big part of independent bookstores, at least until this COVID thing came along, um, we're sort of a hybrid between retail and, um, and an event community building um, operation. So at, at my shop, I'd say we do 150 events a year with authors. So authors are a huge part of, of what we do in addition to selling books and having book clubs. Um, so seeing a world where the author was not as central and it was more about the book as object was mm. really fascinating to me. Because um, certainly I love to just sit and look at the book so many times, but often it is about sales and it is about the next event, um, the, the next author event or the next book club. So it was really interesting for me to see this other um, other world within the book world, but with very similar values, you know, book culture and, and also how small it is, you know, that after a while you really do start to know people. Um, I appreciate that and I like that. Yeah, and I think New York, but. <laughs> 
Sorry. What did you say, Julia? What was the last thing? It, it made me want to go to New York. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And well, actually, that, that was something that I found uh, really interesting as a, a choice that you made, DW, which is uh, the, the just very tight focus on New York book uh, culture, which I think obviously is huge and is very, uh, very much kind of the focus of a lot of how we talk about book worlds in all ways, uh, whether it's antiquarian or major publishers or any of that. Um, you know, New York is definitely the hub. Um, but what what kind of influenced that decision? And was there a time when you thought about maybe trying to expand the geographical focus of the film at all? And I mean, I, I know here in Charlottesville, we are very aware of antiquarian book uh, sellers, and there's a very strong book culture. And I'm sure that there are other hubs like that elsewhere in the country as well. So talk a little bit about that. We were pretty much set on doing it focused on New York from the beginning. I mean, there was a purely practical <laughs> reason, which is that we were all based in New York. Yeah. And then Dan knew a lot of people in New York to get us started. And um, New York, for the rare book trade in, this, in, in the US, really probably is the, the major hub. and has the, the book fair, which is the most important book fair in the country. I think everyone would agree. And, um, and, and I think also it had enough of a variety of different kinds of dealers working at different levels with different kinds of focus that we could get that cross section that I was hoping to achieve. I mean, it wasn't gonna be a perfect, you know, cover every type of rare book dealer imaginable, but we wanted to get enough breadth that you could get a sense of just all that the trade en encompasses. And so New York had that, I think, inevitably. Um, and, you know, I think too, there was a little bit of sense that having lived in New York or in some cases, have, and some of us were from New York originally um, for a long time, seeing the, the changing sort of book landscape of the city and seeing so many stores that I love disappear and, you know, Gotham and stores I used to frequent and um, St. Mark's books, right? You, you can go out at Books and Company on the Upper East Side, just so many are gone. And it's been great to see these new one, ones come in, of course, but maybe you don't have that sort of personal attachment yet. And hopefully that will happen. Um, but, you know, I think that too, that was something we felt like deserved to be captured and recorded. And so I think the feeling that it could be a little bit of a New York movie along the way was, was always there. Yeah, I mean, I agree with Julia. It made me made me want to go to New York, <laughs> especially in a time when none of us are really traveling. Uh, it was a great little armchair traveler experience, uh, and getting to go into the book fairs for people who maybe haven't been to the Antiquarian or the New York Arts Book Fair. I thought that that was just such an awesome way to kind of open those doors and maybe even encourage people to attend next year, assuming things go back to normal soon. Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Yeah. Also, one of, the, one of the thought is that also very, very relevantly, I think we needed to contain who we were talking to and the, the scope of the film in some form, because there are amazing dealers all over the country. Yeah. Um, we could have gone on forever, probably. And so we, it was a way to, I think, force a bit of containment on the film. Yeah, I think it worked well. Can I make a little plug, which is that um, none of us can go to the book fair anytime soon, but the ABAA, the Antiquarian Booksellers Association, is actually doing a virtual book fair on June 4th. It's an experiment. I have no idea what it's going to look like. I'm going to go, go, whatever that means. Um, and they're going to try and make it feel sort of special, like, you know, they're going to release things for people to see at the fair that, you know, no one else will have had a chance to buy. Um, so that's something that everybody can go to. There is a price of admission to the New York Fair. And so not everybody goes, it's certainly, um, and it feels a little bit intimidating, I think, for people who've never been um, or who are going for the first time. But this, uh, so this online version might be a really unusual and welcoming way for people to get a taste of that world through a virtual landscape. That's great to know. Thank you for chiming in with that. Um, and actually, I have a question for you, Molly, about um, one of the quotes from uh, Carolyn Schimmel in the film. She talks about how having a bunch of books open to the title page is really boring when you're putting together an exhibit. And as curator, you know that better than any of the rest of us. Um, and you know, she she references how you really need something like Annie Oakley's gloves to build an exhibit. <laughs> Uh, and I think that that goes back to something that Julia mentioned also where, you know, we think of booksellers as very focused on books, but really they're also focused on events, they're focused on ephemera. There's so many different kind of access points and things that are tangentially related to the actual sale of a book, whether it's new or, or rare. Um, so could you talk a little bit about what goes into your work in that regard? 
Yeah, first of all, she's absolutely right. I curate a lot of exhibitions at UVA and one of the big challenges is you don't want an exhibition that's filled with, with you know, everything being black on white, um, black on white, black on white. It's just, your, your goal is to engage your visitor. And that also applies when we teach classes at UVA. We do tons of classes for undergraduates and graduate students alike. And you know, your goal is to, to, you've got these students standing in a room for 45 minutes, walking around a table, looking at stuff, you know, that, that's hard work actually to stand like that. And so you wanna really keep them engaged. So you need to find those qualities of the books themselves, but then also we have, I'm really glad to say like just an incredibly diverse collection already when it comes to format. But one of the things that I find really interesting is um, in, I work in the 20th century and the contemporary period. That's pretty much what I collect. And um, so much of what has been going on for the last, well, really in a really powerful way for the last 20 years has been books, uh, book publishers trying to make their books compelling in a visual way. And, and Julia could probably speak to this a little bit, uh, but when you're buying um, sort of books that are representative of a moment, for instance, like if I'm trying to build a collection that will show what, what American book culture looked like in the 2000s, um, booksellers do things to create three-dimensional appeal to their books in a bookstore. For instance, you see more and more die cut covers. You see a lot of really interesting things being done with embossing and with different textures. You see a lot of matte covers that are very sensual. And um, so you'll find that at different points in time, um, there are ways that books are themselves made to appeal. You also see that when you, when you are someone who focuses on the 20th and 21st century, you have a lot more opportunity for not black on white because color illustration and illustration methods in printed, printed illustration methods become just so spectacularly diverse. I've been on a bit of a, of a binge lately on day glow. I've gotten really interested in day glow printing from the 1970s and what that does to say children's books and other um, commercial products. And there's certainly nothing like boring about the title page of a day glow book. But if you're someone who works in the 17th century book, you might have exquisite illustrations, really spectacular in certain ways, but you're not gonna have um, that, that kind of vibrancy necessarily um, that is, really necessary often for new audiences who find these objects intimidating. So for, for me, it's just a, an embarrassment of riches. Um, the New York Art Book Fair, uh, which I was thrilled to see featured in the show, um, has a lot of antiquarian dealers who are dealing in materials basically from the late 50s onward. And it's just spectacular what you see there in terms of the range of printed books, the range of things that are called a book, a lot of things that are collections of pamphlets in a box. Um, there's a really famous periodical called Aspen where every issue, um, it has a different structure. And one is the Andy Warhol issue and it's a box of materials. And the box is an Andy Warhol artwork that is a fab laundry detergent box. That's a book. So the book itself um, is just this radically experimental object um, for a lot of its history. Um, but it's even easier in the 20th century and uh, the contemporary period than others to find these really spectacular items. That said, I really love that I have um, in my hands to deal with at work, things like William Faulkner's pipes and pipe cleaners. Um, those work really, really well in an exhibition and we generally don't buy items like that, but we're really excited when they're donated to us and when we have them in the collection. They're costly to deal with. They um, textiles um, require conservation work. Three-dimensional objects require different housings. They require specialized cataloging skills. So we have to calculate all of that into the decision-making, especially when we're bringing strange items into the collection. And Julia, did you wanna add anything? Yeah, to I wanna say um, with the covers of books, um, I, I always say, yes, people do judge a book by its color, um, by its cover. Uh, our challenge is we have 20,000 books in the shop and I would like them all to be faced out. I want everyone to see them, but of course you can't. You have to decide which ones are gonna get face out, um, which ones are gonna get in the window. You're right, I was thinking about you know, our, our velvet, um, I think it's Kobe Bryant um, partnered with someone had a, a velvet cover on 
um, a book, a tennis book for children, fantasy tennis. Uh, we get some really, for some reason, people like like bumpy covers. They, they want to buy a book with like a, you know, there's some embossing, there's something shiny, there's something going on. Um, and there's there's amazing graphic design happening right now um, with new books, and it's always it's always wonderful to see the new things coming in. I guess the our equivalent of um, Faulkner's pipe would be sidelines. Um, you know, in, a, in an all new bookshop, um, there's the books and there's the sidelines. So you go into Barnes and Noble and the sidelines are all the toys and all the bags and all the journals and little things, little doodads. Um, we have pushed against that in the past. Um, we're never gonna be the kind of bookstore. There's some bookstores that sell like glasses and naughty socks and we don't really do that, um, but we do have tote bags. <laughs> Everyone likes a tote bag, and um, we're going to do t-shirts soon. That's my plug. So we are getting into the, the 20, 20th century there. But yeah, we're pretty much straight up books here, um, as you can see. <laughs> Very good. Um, and so to change gears entirely, we have a question from an attendee and then also a question that I had. Um, one of the things about the film that I think is really excellent is the attention that you give to the people whose archives are maybe underappreciated or overlooked, uh, whose histories are really at risk for being lost uh, unless someone really goes out and specifically aims to collect it. So you feature the hip hop uh, archivist, you feature uh, Carolyn who is working to collect histories of American women. And I I think that you did that with attention and with great care and I really appreciated that and I'd love to hear more about kind of how you went through that decision making process about where to focus that attention. Uh, and then also how you found the people that you talked to and, uh, and, you know, more about that. Yeah, well, you know, I think um, that was always something we were keen on doing was to, I think, again, I think it's a little bit of a, uh, part of the desire to show what, how people in this world are doing important work and relevant work and work that's charting new ground and that, you know, has a relationship with institutions and academia too. And so I think, you know, obviously a lot of what's going on right now is a reevaluation of history, of people's roles in history, of all this kind of stuff and, you know, representation and so on. And I think there, people like Caroline and others have really played an, an interesting and unique role outside of academia in contributing to that. Um, and so that, you know, how dealers and collectors are able to do that was something I really wanted to establish and, and investigate. Um, and so Carol, you know, for Caroline, for example, we just sort of realized she was a really important collector and she seemed a perfect fit for someone, you know, kind of a more established, big, serious collector who whose collection I think was now over a course of a great period of time, it achieved a real prominence. And um, so she was, that's sort of how we came to her. And, you know, Sarita, it's a little more, I think of an organic process um, because she's kind of right at the cutting edge now, I think of, and when Molly was talking about what's considered books has, is changing and what falls under the rare book umbrella is maybe evolving um, as it always is. Uh, I think, you know, perhaps 20 years ago, that would have been a harder sell, but now I think, um, something like that because it has cultural and historical importance um, is more accepted or is becoming more accepted. And Arthur Fournier, who handles a lot of amazing material that of the type sort of post-war uh, material that, that Molly mentioned as well as hip hop stuff and stuff from the Middle East. And um, he, he actually brought us to Sarita. So I, had, and so that's how it's, what's great when you're making documentaries is it's an, it's an evolving process. You're learning as you're going, you're discovering as you're going. And that's one of the potentially very rewarding things about making documentaries. And so after speaking to Arthur and sort of learning a lot from him, um, you know, I was, we were talking about, I was at that point was feeling ready to reach out to some really younger collectors, people doing more interesting sort of stuff outside the sort of traditional mold. And he mentioned that Sarita was someone he knew he thought did really cool stuff, what she, the material she was handling. And so that's how we got to Sarita. And um, I think, I didn't have room, of course, to put in all the younger collectors I would have liked to and all the, but, you know, I thought she was a great fit. Um, and I also sort of love 90s hip hop. So I was kind of personally excited to be able to bring that into a, a rare book documentary and kind of explore how that's not what you would expect to have there. Um, yeah. 
and you know and, and two like the schomburg center in new york um is, is an amazing institution and has incredible material and um i think the nypl the main branch has been you know it's kind of well known and established there was just the frederick wiseman movie and obviously they have treasures galore there but i think it was more interesting and meaningful to you know hone in a little more on the schomburg and um and plus kevin young is you know is, is amazing and so getting a chance to interview him was very rewarding too yeah we we actually had uh kevin young in the virginia festival of the book a couple of years ago and he was just incredible so i was very happy to see him there and like you said the schomburg is just amazing and something that if uh attendees have not uh explored the resources that they have i highly recommend it um you also mentioned Frederick Wiseman, and actually that aligns really well with a question from one of our attendees, which is, uh, who do you count as your inspirations as a documentary filmmaker? Whose work have you looked to over the years to kind of find your personal sense of filmmaking? Not really Frederick Wiseman, but um, <laughs> I, say. I, respect, I respect Wiseman and I you know, like his films to varying degrees, depending on the film. Um, it's really uh, Chris Marker and Ennis Varda, the two, documentary filmmakers that I'm like kind of like are the pillars for me that I personally am the most I think influenced by and have the most fondness for their work um so that I think all the cats in the movie was like it was real, I mean I like cats and bookstores and books and cats have a long standing relationship but it was particularly nice then because they are always you know fond of inserting cats into their films so I it was nice that we kind of you know um could do that too here that is, that is an excellent alignment right there. I like it. Um, let's see if we have we, other questions. And this we, do is have, a, we do not have a bookstore cat. Makes me really <laughs> have you, I, have an employee, I have an employee who's allergic, so unfortunately, no. There we, we go. Little stuff, yeah, that'd be crazy. Um, so a quick call out to attendees. If you have questions for either DW, Molly, or Julia, um, go ahead and post them in the Q&A section. We have a couple more that I'm going to get to soon, um, but feel free to keep those coming as, as you would like. Um, coming back to you, Molly, you are obviously a you know woman in the field of collecting, and I'm curious to hear how your uh, experiences lined up with the women who were interviewed in the film and um, kind of what your perspective is on the diversity of the field when it comes to gender. Yeah, so I'm in a very different world um, because I'm in the world of librarianship. And before that, I was in the world of English PhD academia, both of which have a much higher percentage of women than bookselling does. And I think some of that has to do with the kind of capital you need in order to start up a rare book selling business. And, um, and also there is a long history of, um, and they mention this in the film, um, of, of book dealers being named after the husband. And it, that's still the case. There are many, many dealers I love to work with who are women who, um, who work under the name of their husband. Um, and, and it's just, it's a long tradition and it, I think it's changing. Um, but it's definitely different in the in the library world. Um, I would say, if anything, if I'm an outlier in my world, I'm an outlier as an extrovert in an introvert world. Um, but really, in in the in the book world, where I find um, I'm, I also where if I find there's sort of a, a diversity issue for me, it's being a 20th century and contemporary specialist in the library world, where um, it's that's still a bit of an outlier position. It's interesting. I. I've met a surprising number of people who are rare book librarians who don't seem to understand what there is to do with the 20th century book. Um, and I, it's, it's a kind of a perpetual thorn in, in my side when people say, well, there's nothing really interesting about the 20th century book. And then my head explodes and I, I try to be very calm and you know, give some great examples of which there's so many. I mean, the 20th century book or the, industri the book of the industrial era is interesting in very different ways from the books that uh, established the field of bibliography. And I find that fascinating. But much more important than gender diversity, I think, is racial diversity. And that is a huge issue in the antiquarian book world and one that various um, dealers that I know are really concerned about and really trying to work on. Because like I said, there's this, there's this issue of the cost of, of entering that field. And also the very fact of the whiteness of the field. I think can make it um, seem exclusionary, even if it's not intentionally exclusionary. 
um, and also can make it just literally financially exclusionary um, for people from certain demographic groups. So there are some efforts underfoot to figure out how to make the field more welcoming to young booksellers of color. Um, and I've always like, whenever I see a young bookseller of color, I'm really excited because I feel like it's, I find myself buying a lot of really amazing African-American material for our collections. That's a huge collecting area for us. I'm buying it almost entirely from white men. Hmm. So for me, I end up in this sort of conundrum where I think, well, I really want to be, I want to buy this material. I'm going to buy this material. We need it for our collections. This is a huge strength of ours. It's a very important collecting area, but like, I wish that I could be supporting, um, probably the someone in, in the chain of the family from which that book came. You know, some someone African-American probably owned that book. It went to a very small regional dealer who doesn't even have an internet presence. And then up maybe one or two more, more you know, steps on that pyramid until it hit a dealer who I intersect with. And it's very difficult to find your way down that pyramid where the book gets more and more costly as you go up. Um, but it also moves further and further away from um, the community um, to which the producer of the book belonged. Um, and so that to me is one of the most challenging um, aspects is, can I do anything to help promote um, diversity in book selling? Um, we're working really hard on promoting diversity in librarianship and rare book librarianship in particular. Um, and so I guess we kind of start there. And there are some um, people who who disappear from the librarian world into book selling. Um, so maybe some of that will happen. But to me, that's probably the most critical issue right now is diversifying the field in terms of race and ethnicity. Yeah, and I think that the documentary does a great job of addressing that head on and getting a lot of different opinions, um, both about how the field needs to adapt and really grow and be more welcoming to people of color, to people who are younger, uh, to women, to a variety of different groups. Uh, but then also, you know, I think that you go out of your way again, DW, to really present a, a wide range of opinions uh, when it comes to kind of whether there is hope for books generally, uh, for antiquarian books, for booksellers overall. Uh, and I think that you, you represent a lot of people's opinions and some are very doom and gloom, others are much more uh, you know, we are in the book renaissance and this is just going to get better from here. So I think uh, a question I have and a question that an attendee actually echoes is, uh, I'm curious to hear from all three of you how you feel about your little corner of that world. Um, DW, obviously, you know, speaking on behalf of kind of the people that you interviewed, but Molly and Julia, speaking from your own personal experience, do you think the book and, you know, book shops are dying or really uh, coming around? Well, I, you know, I, I'm always asked this question sort of, and I feel like, who am I to answer this question <laughs> versus all the people in the movie who obviously are much more attuned to the matter and have much more personal stake in it. But I mean, I, I kind of answer and then I, I feel like I want to, I feel there's legitimacy to the arguments on both sides to certain degrees, but I feel like I want to choose optimism at least <laughs> as maybe the choice itself is what makes the difference. Um, and I think, you know, the advent of lots of newer bookstores is really um, exciting. And if they're not, maybe the some of the book, if it's hard to create the bookstores that I kind of love most, which are the sprawling, disorganized used bookstore where you can, you know, get lost in, but, you know, real with real estate and other considerations, that's maybe not so realistic for the most part anymore. But there's lots that can be offered with the, I think, the social aspect and the communal the, you know, as we, I think, as mentioned in the film, the sort of relationship with community um, that, that the new bookstores are are creating. Um, and, you know, I think for the trade itself, for the rare book trade, it's a little different because, you know, they have a slightly more specific set of concerns than your average bookstore. And I think kind of the, the big concern there is more about, I think, a constriction of the trade, like a gradual diminishment, as maybe people are collecting less over time and, you um, it's just like, it won't be what, it won't be the flourishing trade it has maybe been and it will sort of become something smaller and so hyper specific that maybe won't be as interesting as it is to the people who are in it, you know, as it is now and has been. Um, but you think the generational divide is really what I picked up on a lot um, is that I think for the people who, you know, 
made their way before the internet upheaval, there was a kind of slightly more romanticized and different reality. And it was built on a long tradition that whatever flaws it had was still a very particular tradition with many good points, I think, and um, a, a way of doing business that was fairly consistent for a fairly long time. And so I think, you know, this, this the kinds of discoveries you could make by just traveling around and driving around and, you know, visiting odd little bookstores in the middle of the country or, you know, now everyone knows what stuff's worth and that's much harder. So I think part of the generational sort of pessimism is a little bit of a sadness for that loss and a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a sort of regret, but also a little uncertainty how, what the next phase was gonna, would look like. Um, and but that's a natural thing, this generational switch. So I think it's great the, to me, just the sheer excitement of a lot of the younger dealers and the fact that you do see them doing really different things. I think Heather and Rebecca, um, their prize is a really interesting um, uh, approach. And, and I, it, with a little more time, would love to have like gone into some of those collectors and what they're doing. Because so if you can visit, if you're interested, like visit their website and look at some of that stuff. Because if you're curious about what kind of collecting that can be done, that doesn't cost money in any great way. It's more about just the idea itself, the concept of what you're doing and pursuing it. They're a great, that's a great place to start, I think, in many respects. What about you, Molly? What do you think about the, the future of the field? Oh, I'm, I fall 110% on the optimist side. Um, I, I think that, yeah, I think nostalgia is a really big issue in rare book selling and I think it's legitimate. I think you described it really well. I also actually, it was interesting, it just didn't get really covered as much in the film, but I've, I've heard some wonderful nostalgia for the early days of eBay that when the internet first came about, people made incredible buys, incredible finds for nothing on eBay because nobody yet knew what things were worth. And I was in grad school at the time and I knew this was happening and I had no money and I couldn't buy anything. And I love hearing story, stories from dealer friends of mine who tell me about just some of the just incredible discoveries. So there's even nostalgia for the early internet. Um, so the internet itself is not, it's not a static thing that has happened. It itself has changed so dramatically over the last you know, 25 years or whatever, since, since eBay really started um, changing or maybe 20, a little less than 25 years since eBay started changing things. But I'm on the, I'm on the optimist end of things. Um, I, I see students, um, undergraduates get incredibly excited about books. I see professors including visits to special collections in more and more of their classes. Um, and this is a national trend that we see at special collections across the country. Um, they all want access to tangible objects to help teach their students history. And there's an, maybe an irony there that, you know, there's always been this concern that the rise of the internet means that people aren't reading. It's a visual culture instead of a reading culture. But um, in some ways, I think that means um, it's a reading and a visual culture, but also and a tactile culture, meaning there's a specialness to the tactile that, um, that wasn't the case before the internet, like getting off your phone and looking at something physical, you're looking at it something three-dimensional in in relation to that standard virtual experience, which is sounds horrible, but it actually means that the things that we talk about are, are more important to young people in a different way. And so, first of all, I find that really interesting and really interesting to engage with really young people thinking about books. Um, I also, because I, I do a lot of work with artist books and the book arts, I go to the New York Art Book Fair and I go to the, the LA Art Book Fair, which I prefer actually to the New York Art Book Fair. They're both run by Printed Matter, which is a very important gallery bookstore in New York that's been around for a very long time. Um, it's sort of it's sort of in the vibe of the, that new generation of bookstores, but it's a it's a very, very um, longstanding, wonderful business. They run these two fairs and you go and there's like 30,000 people in a weekend at the LA or the New York New York um, Art Book Fair. It's, you know, the professionals who I feel really dorky when I go to those fairs. Whereas when I go to the New York Antiquarian Book Fair, I feel really young. It's great. I feel kind of young and hip. It's all relative. Um, so, well, not hip, I mean, never hip, but you know, comparatively, but these fairs are amazing because you, you meet all these young artists who are making books. You meet all these young publishers of small presses who are producing books. And then you see all these young people who go on a date to the LA art book fair to hang out and look at books and just kind of be cool. Um, that is, 
one of the most wonderful things you can do for yourself if you're worried about the future of the book is go to one of those fairs. Um, and also, I don't know, like the last time I was in New York, I'm gonna show how behind the, behind the times I am, but I discovered McNally Jackson, um, this bookstore that blew my mind and it was selling, you know, just the most exquisite selection of books, um, including artist books, a great selection of artist books. I was blown away, it was packed with people. There was an event going on while I was there, as Julia mentions, like this, these, these events, I mean, they are hugely popular. Um, so I tend to be an optimist. I tend to think, well, if things are, are closing and dying off, something else is gonna come and take their place. Humans are collectors. It's what we do. Um, so many people are collectors and book collectors are not gonna go away. Um, and de book dealers won't either. Um, it's, it's, it's here to stay. Excellent. Julia, what are your thoughts? I'd un unmute there because the phones are, phones are ringing. So I guess that's a sign. No. <laughs> that's a sign. The balance sheet is good. Um, I, I really like what, what, both you, what, what was said in the, in the film about um, the wonder that the printed book, what you can learn from the marginalia, what you can learn from how the book was treated, how the owner experienced the book, and then what Molly said about how the students come in and, and, and see the object, and, and they do, they want to, people want to want to touch a book, they want to experience it um, in a tactile way, and what you can learn about a book later um, is pretty fascinating, what people have written. I always say that one of the reasons I really don't want to read on a Kindle, I know you can highlight, but I really want to, I really like writing in a book. Um, so, I mean, one, one thing that people really, um, still almost fetishize uh, in new books is the sign I think you're for the author. Maybe. Oh, I'm breaking up? Yeah, just a little bit. So repeat what you just said. I said um, one thing um, I think that we do as an independent bookstore that people cannot get online is the, um, again, the, the author event with the, with the signed book. It's very interesting that, you know, in our contemporary culture, people still crave having a signed book by the author and what that means to them, having something personalized, personalized object. Um, so I think bookstores, uh, indie bookstores have had that, that swing. Um, there's been a lot of talk about them going out of business and certainly many did during the area of uh, the era of, of uh, box stores, you know, the books a million um, coming in and, and putting the indies out of business. But then there's been this uh, resurgence of the independent bookstore as a community center, um, as a way to um, bring young people in for book clubs, um, for author events. And I see bookstores as having to change, you know, it is a hybrid, um, and yet making it go beyond retail and be more about community building, um, brings in that diversity element, brings in the community element. And is really what's interesting to me um, the most about owning a bookstore. Um, will it always look the same? You know, I don't know. People say, what's the future gonna bring? And it's like, well, if we can predict the future, <laughs> make a million dollars. But um, I guess we'll just, just have to keep changing. I mean, my business has changed more in the last two months than in a very, very, very long time. And I can talk more about that, but. <laughs> That's another event. <laughs> that is another event. <laughs> Well, we are pretty much out of time here. Um, so I want to give each of you a chance to say any final thing that you, uh, you know, want people to know um, before we sign off. But um, I will just say thank you again for being part of this conversation and uh, chime in if you want to give a, a quick shout out to anything that you have coming up or that you want people to be able to check out. You know, I'm just going to add something that I was thinking about when Molly was talking. Um, and we talk, and maybe it circles back to the your opening and the Sontag quote from letter to her letter to Borges and um, about you know books being sort of a and 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 Susan Arleen taps into the exact same thing with book when she talks about books being part of our cultural DNA and um, I think you know there's been a number of studies and a lot of sort of some research about how when you're reading long form text in a physical in a, on a you know via a physical book that you have a connection with your sort of brain that is different than when you're reading it on screen and that you have greater retention and greater kind of different levels of engagement. And I think 
that if I think that seems true to me for, for my own personal you know, experience that I relate very differently when I'm reading a physical book to the, to the, the language of the text um, than I do if I read something on a screen. And I think if maybe if that is scientifically like proven further and, and established in a way that it almost becomes necessary if you wanna have the best possible experience of something, it's understood you should be reading a physical book that could kind of almost ensure a kind of scientific future, you know, um, purpose to physical books as a sort of counterpoint to the ease of the digital text. Or, and obviously there are reasons why digital text is being searchable and this and that is reference and is, is important too. But um, it'd be nice to think that books still offer something above as analog devices that's somehow tied directly into our human makeup that's greater than the digital. Um, I like that. We will go ahead and work on commissioning that study soon. Right. <laughs> uh, Molly, Julia, did you guys have anything to add? I would say go buy your books from New Dominion Books <laughs> from <laughs> Virginia. <laughs> That's right. Support independent booksellers and, and go have some fun online at abebooks.com if you've never looked at antiquarian books before or go to the ABAA website too. Um, it's a great place to find dealers in your own region. Uh, they separate the website out for ABAA dealers by region. Um, and uh, everybody can afford antiquarian books. Um, sometimes I buy things for $2 to add to our collection. Doesn't mean they're not valuable. And Molly, if people want to look at the collections or exhibits that you've curated at UVA, can they do that online? Yeah, they can go to small.library.virginia.edu to learn about what we have in special collections at UVA. Molly, you need to come look at my basement here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> People come in with a glint in their eye and they say, do you have a basement? Yeah, we do. This is a hundred year old shop and they're, they're down there. I'll take you up on that. I'm coming over. I'm coming over as soon as this quarantine is over. There you go. Well, again, DW, Molly, Juliet, thank you so much for being part of this conversation today. Thank you for uh, a wonderful film, DW, uh, one that I am eager to share with so many people. Uh, thank you to the Virginia Film Festival also for hosting this event and to all of the community partners who helped make it possible, including the Virginia Center for the Book, uh, which is my world. And uh, thank you all for attending and listening in. I believe this will be archived and viewable online if you want to share it with others afterwards, but uh, uh, I hope that the rest of your day it goes well. So thank you. Thanks everyone. Great talking. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 That was great. <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> See you soon. <laughs>